put on the full armor of God, for when the day of evil comes, you behave to stand your ground. After you have done everything to stand, Ephesians 6, 13. Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Amen. Amen. Psalm 119, 73 through 80. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice, for I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteousness, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love come for me, O Lord, according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me, that I may live, for my delight is in your law. Let the, let the insolent be put to shame, for they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. Psalm 119, verse 81 to 88. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you come for me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your rules. All your commandments are sure. They they wrong me with falsehood. Save me. They have almost made an end to me on the earth, but I do not forsake your law. Let your steadfast love give me life that I may learn that may keep your testimonies of your mouth. Psalm 119, verses 89 through 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures through all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen the limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. John three fourteen through 17. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I have hidden your words in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.11 I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner Worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. Romans fifteen one to two. For, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you shall be saved. Amen. Amen. So, a few months ago, the kids of our church, um, they were baking some sweets, some cakes. And it was a really good idea, actually, because, like, the money which was raised from this fundraiser, it was, like, it was $300 in... This money was sent to one Ukrainian church, and some people who were in need, they received some help from, from our church, from Hosanna Church, and actually this, this is really good, and this is a really great idea. So um, uh, I will say a few words about those people who were in need in Ukraine. Um, firstly, I just wanted to, 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 like, to tell you a short story. When I was a child, I remember, like, I was growing just in a usual family, like, two kids, my dad, mom working, and nothing, nothing special, just, like, you know, normal life. We had everything we needed in life, and, um, but my dad, he always, I remember he always was trying to take me uh, to visit the families which were, like, in need, and which, 
those families who, who were in need and who had less than we have. And um, actually, this is the family we visited a lot. Uh, so for that time, when I was a child, this woman, she had only those two kids, the older ones. And I remember they, they actually lived very poor. Um, her husband was in prison for a long, long time. And uh, her life is a struggle. And um, after he was released from the prison, he just left them. And I don't know where he went. He visited them just for two times. And yeah, he, he, he doesn't help them. And he just left them. So her life is pretty like tough. And her, her life is a struggle. So I remember my mom was cooking before Easter, and my dad, he, he told her, like, you know, we have to visit this family before Easter. And usually we Ukrainians cook very much for, for holidays. I don't know how Romanians, but we cook much more than we need, you know, sweets and everything, meat. And uh, I remember my dad, he, like, my mom, like, put everything in boxes, and we, we had two plastic, like two plastic bags, they were black, I remember, and we went to that family. My, my dad took me and my brother, and I remember when we came, she was crying, she, she went into tears, like she was trying to put all this food to her fridge, she opened the fridge, and the fridge was like, it was empty, it was like just milk and, and butter, that's it, that, that. so th at that time, I was a child, I was, I was going home speechless, because for me, having enough to eat for Easter and for them, just empty fridge, it was, it was hard to see that. So I was a child, but I was speechless. So the reason I'm telling this story is like, is it was a lesson from my dad. So I always remember the lessons from my dad. And it's a really good idea for us as parents to teach our kids those lessons because the seeds we plant, they give good fruits in the future. So we visited this family a, long, like, a lot of times, and even when I grew up and we got married with Vlad, we also visited them. And then Elena was born, we also visited them. So it's, it was really a good tradition for them, for us to visit them. So this time, they're, they're, her kids, they, they were in need of some clothes, they were in need of some jacket, and oh, this is actually the other woman. Yeah, this is her. This is her daughter, the smaller one. So she needed some, some shoes, as I see. They bought some shoes for them and some food. They brought some food for them. So they were really very, very thankful for this help from our church. And yeah, praise God for that. So also in our church in Ukraine, there are a lot of refugees. This is the family from the east part of Ukraine. Uh, they came when the war started. It's a family, it's a big family of eight kids, and their city is now, it's under huge attack. So they just left their house, they left their jobs, they lost everything. But God is good, you know, like, thanks God, they came to our church, and one family moved abroad, and they just gave their house to leave. They just, they just told them, leave in our house, that's it. So, yeah, they are living now in that house, but it's hard, he found some job. They are trying to cope, and they are blessed to be in our best Ukrainian church. So thanks God for that. So they needed also some help, and they shared this money. That's a good thing that this money, it was not a big amount, but it was a blessed amount because they shared this money between different families, and everyone received some help, and every, everyone was blessed with this sum of money which they received. So also there are a few more refugees yeah, this brother um, in um, like in red coat and red jacket, it's a refugee. And then and this is the pastor actually of our church, brother Ivan or Ivan, we call him Ivan. It's my uncle actually, my, my dad's brother. He's our pastor. Yeah, so this, one, this brother also, this sister... And one more, one more man, they are refugees also from the east part of Ukraine. They needed some help. They are members of our church now in Ukraine. Yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of refugees from the east. They just had to, left, to leave their houses because, because of the war, because of attacks. Their houses are just destroyed. And it's hard. I can't imagine how people just leave their homes and they 
they just move and they don't know where to stay because they understand their houses are destroyed, they have no money to buy new houses. It's hard, it's a hard situation now in Ukraine. Just, I'm praying and I ask you to pray for Ukraine now because two years of war and it seems to me it will, it will not stop and only God can stop this. Yeah, and also uh, it's a really good tradition in our church Every year, on, for holidays, probably for Easter and Christmas, they visit the nurse house where, like, lonely people live and where, yeah, they, they just need some, you know, good word, God's word, some help. So they, um, they like, they bought some fruits, some sweets, and they made some boxes for them, some bags for them with the streets and yeah they visited them they were singing carols and yeah it was a big blessing for them also so in general this sum of money was like it was for everyone who was in need in our church and thanks god for that everyone received this help and everyone felt this blessing from us from from our from our hosanna church and i'm I'm very thankful for that, for, for this church, for the pastor, for the people, for the kids who was baking and the parents who spend their time. And for, like, for the end, I just want to read um, like a verse from, from the Bible. It's Matthew 20, chapter 25, verse 35. If you, if you can share, please. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the word. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. And I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, we, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes to clothe you? When did we see you seek in a prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did that for me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love it when community time <clears throat> is, is full of, of uh, good works that we can proclaim that God has done in our life, whether it's through the children's bake sale and the money that goes to help um, the families in Ukraine, whether it's personal testimony about um, Winterfest. Um, and normally, I would always ask before I would start, are you sure there's not somebody who has a testimony that wasn't given the opportunity to say something, say something. So before I start today, I'm gonna to be gracious and give you five minutes, right? Maybe you might not need five minutes, but is there anyone else that would like to close out community time and to help edify the church with a testimony? If not, okay. Um, tech team, thank you for having the slides up there. Um, good morning and God bless everyone here. If you uh, find yourself here just on a random Sunday or if you just happen to um, open up online, you're actually here for the sequel of last week's sermon. Um, I guess more better put is that we didn't finish last week and so we're making up time. So we had to ask Brother Arell if he can preach you know, push him off another week, but it's okay because Lord willing, we have plenty of Sundays to be able to uh, preach the word of God, so it was no problem. Um, and so we'll just try to have a small recap of what we talked about last week, so that that way we're all on the same page, and then we can finish off um, the sermon that was prepared for, for last week. So if you've been following us either in person or online, you know that Brother Lemmy, <clears throat> decided with uh, many of us from the leadership that we're going to be teaching and preaching on uh, the road or the path to uh, repentance and redemption. So that was kind of the, the theme in which the last few weeks and the next couple weeks coming up, we'll be focusing on whether it's myself or Pastor Arell or, or Greg or Lemmy, uh, we're going to be focusing on this topic because it's such, such a beautiful and such an important topic. Um, 
I know last week maybe there was some things that we didn't want to hear or some things that maybe kind of uh, scratched our ears in a way. And don't worry, that's why we are here to clarify things, just because I know sometimes Brother Chris speaks a little too fast. And so we can drop a word here or there. And I want to make sure that everything is, is uh, uh, preached and understood in context. So uh, with that being said, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God. And we see this every time that we open the Bible, even uh, when Sister Lona read from, from Matthew 25, uh, and we see that God works in those who reach out to those who are less fortunate, to those who cannot eat anything or drink anything. Um, and we do those things not to gain any notoriety for ourselves, but we do them for the least of these for the name of God and for the work of God. And so this is all profitable, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, and for training in righteousness that a man or a woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Some of my Baptist friends will say, if you want to hear the audible voice of the Lord, which a lot of us, you know, have you ever heard, you know, that voice of the Lord in your, in your mind when you're praying. He says, one way you can do it is read your Bible out loud. And it makes sense because these are the word of God. And so if you were to read this out loud, you could say that you heard the voice of God, the words of God audibly. So that being said, just a small introduction to understand how important it is and why it is that we preach the word of God, and spend time in his word. Last week, we had this example here because we talked about repentance and the importance of repentance and, and how that comes across a little bit differently in culture. When we hear this word in today's culture in the United States, we often think of, of street preachers. We often think of those who are holding their picket signs and who are very bluntly saying two or three sentences and only repeating that sentence. And so we decided that, you know, isn't this what Jesus spoke of? And isn't this what John the Baptist said when they preached? And they also started or summarized their sermons in repent for the kingdom of God is near. Well, let me tell you something. The culture of the time where Jesus and John the Baptist was preaching was very different than our time and culture. And so sometimes we have to adjust not the message, but the way in which we bring the message to the culture for it to make sense. Something that I didn't talk about last time because I was running out of time and I also forgot is the fact that when Jesus and John the Baptist were preaching, the young men that were around, from young to old, they came from a culture that they studied and memorized large portions of the Torah or the Word of God that they had at the time. So when they were able to hear the words of John the Baptizer or hear the words of Christ, when he said things like, repent for the kingdom of God is near, they already knew the context in which they were hearing and what they meant by those sermons. So they already understood the law of God. They understood the breaking of the law of God. They already understood what it took to wipe away or cleanse the nation and the people of their sin, which at the time was a blood sacrifice. They knew what Jesus was saying, and they knew what John was saying in context to that culture. Now, how different is that culture to today's culture? Well, randomly when I go on social media, I would see some guys go up and ask people who were filling their car with gas, and they would say, if you could tell me one verse from the Bible, I'll pay for your tank of gas. I know, right? I wish they were around here when we were putting gas. And sadly, maybe two out of ten would say a Bible verse. They would go to Home Depot and have $100 gift cards. A $100 gift card. That can buy a lot of drywall, right? So, and they would ask these people, and they would film them with their phones and say, uh, you can have this gift card if you give me one verse from the Bible. And again, people, the majority of the time, could not say one verse from the Bible. 
So to me, it's very difficult to go out there and have signs like this where it says that repent of your sins, repent, the end is near. Because when they don't understand the word of God or the law of God or the context in what you're saying, you could be missing or being uh, mistranslated or misinterpreted with these types of uh, uh, street preaching or what these types of signs. Now, I've seen godly and blessed street preachers, and they don't take this route. They actually have questions on a board, and they say you can answer a question and get a $5 gift card, and it brings in entertaining um, and uh, interesting dialogue, and then the, the Bible could uh, be interpreted and the gospel could be said. But since we're teaching on this topic of repenting, one of the things that came into my head is that one of these street preachers had this message, and if someone were to show them from the Bible, Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, we talked about this last time, but it says that when Judas, when he betrayed Jesus and he saw that Jesus was condemned, the Bible uses the word, he repented and brought back again the 30 pieces of silver's to the chief priests. Yet we all know that Judas did not inherit forgiveness or repentance or salvation and through the avenue of suicide now is in agony and hellfire for the sins that he has committed, chief of which was the fact that he betrayed Christ. One of the things that we talked about last time was the fact that Judas was the most evil of all men. Judas is more evil than Hitler. Judas is more evil than Stalin. Judas is more evil than the most evil of the atheists. Why? Because Judas walked with and ate with and partook with and had fellowship with the Son of God. Day by day, night by night, sermon after sermon, and yet he still chose to sin rather than to repent. Well, Brother Chris, don't you, doesn't the Bible say that he repented here? Yes, it does, and we talked about some of that confusion uh, last time. And so what I would like to do is reiterate the verses that we're going to focus on today and continue the message. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you don't, it should be on the screen. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. And the, term, the, 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 the subject of today's sermon and last week was godly sorrow and good grief. Now, these are words that we don't like to talk about, let alone have uh, a parent or present in our life. Sorrow, we don't want to be in sorrow. Grief, we don't want to be in grief. But the word of God teaches us and tells us how these things can be a blessing for us. And so we see here, let's read it together, uh, the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth. And this is what it says. Even if I, Paul, caused you sorrow in my letter, I do not regret it, though... I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while, yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so we were not, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Here's the verse of the hour. So godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, earnestness and eagerness to clear yourselves of any indignation. What alarm, longing, and concern, and readiness to see that justice is done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. For I wrote to you, it was neither on the account of the one who did wrong or the one who was injured party, but rather that before God you could see yourselves for how devoted to us you are. Amen. So we brought this text. There's a lot of verses here, but the one in bold is really the one that we taught on and will continue to teach on today. One thing that we wanted to get clear and something that came from commentary from Pastor John is this, that our physical pain warns us of physical danger. 
So if we were to put our hand on the stove or if we were to uh, be sitting on something that was sharp or if something were to be cutting our skin, the immediacy of the pain registered by our brain to, through our nerves tells us that we are in danger and that we need to either fix it, run, whatever it may be. And what this pastor said is that the spiritual pain or that which is guilt or grief is a warning for us of spiritual danger. And God has instituted not only a way for us to be careful of our flesh and our bodies, but also a way for us to be careful about our souls, about our spirits. A lot of the time when we ask somebody and there is a topic of guilt or sorrow, they usually drop their heads. They usually are in a status of remorse. They usually don't want to talk about it. But unfortunately, that is a foolish thing to do, to not address, to not talk about these areas in our life, because they are screaming there is an alarm of spiritual danger. If I neglect my spouse, if I neglect my children, if I neglect my reading, so that when someone asks, hey, how is your marriage? How are your kids? How is your reading of the Bible? And and, and we feel guilt because it's not as it should be. It's not something that we should ignore. Instead, God uses that as for us, a sign for us that there is spiritual danger. And I know that's the case because if we continue to ignore our guilt when it comes to being a spouse, it leads to trouble. If we continue to ignore our guilt when it comes to how we raise or what we do with our children, it leads to danger. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but definitely in the future, it is to come. And so God uses guilt and sorrow for us to recognize that there is potential spiritual danger in our lives. And so don't ignore it, address it. And I think the best way is the same way in which Paul addresses it in his letter. We see in these verses, he felt guilty or he felt bad. He had some regret when he first sent the letter to the church about the issues that they were having. And he knew it was going to hurt their feelings, yet... He sent it anyways. And there's some conversations within our spouse, our children, our friends, and between us and God that are going to hurt. But I can guarantee you we will not regret it. And so last time we talked about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And like was said before, the church in Corinth wasn't like Hosanna Christian Church. Okay, they, they, they had issues. Every church has issues. You're right, they do. But the issues that they had was ranging from spiritual immaturity to, to arrogance to sexual morality to worship of idols to eating food that was worshiped to idols. And so there were so many things going on in that church. And yet Paul, he doesn't ignore it. He doesn't say that that's just how the church is. That's just how those believers received their faith. No, he is bold enough to understand that if he preaches the truth in love, like Brother Lemmy has said multiple times, that they won't be harmed, yet God will bring repentance and salvation in their lives. You see, lots of times when we're in sorrow and we want to address that guilt, We don't address it in love. We address it in something like, whether it be justice or whether it be arrogance, whatever it may be. The way in which we should approach our areas of life, whether it be with people or with God, would be to come together and to understand that if somebody is harmed by how we've approached them, whether they've hurt us or we've hurt them, that we're not doing it right. Because Paul gives us that formula. That even though he said something that was difficult to swallow, or a bitter pill is what we say in the American culture, they weren't hurt, they weren't harmed. Instead, he rejoices that he wrote what he wrote. You see, a lot of the times, we want to understand and get our point across, but if we're not doing that in truth and in love, it could lead to regret and not rejoicing. So then, Brother Chris, we talked about last time that the Bible uses in many different places that word repentance. And it's very key to understand. Now, in newer translations, they take out repentance and add in remorse. So the Bible scripture in the new NIV for Judas will not say that he repented. It will say that he had 
remorse. And so what is the difference? Well, the words there in the Greek, so we're getting next level of Bible study, but it's okay. It's good for us to refresh our, our Greek uh, because I know I butcher it all the time. But the word there is, is used in 2 Corinthians is not the same word that Matthew, the author of the gospel, uses for Judas. They're not doing the same thing, and God did not have the same thing happen. And so if Judas repented, quote-unquote, like the Bible says, and yet it led to death, and Paul is saying that when we re- repent from godly sorrow, it leads to life, there has to be a difference. There cannot be, the Bible cannot make a mistake. And the Bible, in fact, doesn't. The word that is used in 2 Corinthians, the repentance that brings to life, is called metanoia. And, and, and the word that brings to death, or the one that is more focused on the emotions, is metalalea, or metamialea. And so they can both be translated into repentance, but only one deals with the changing of how your grief or how the sin in which you have done is changed at a level of the mind. Now, Brother Chris, why does the Bible say this? In Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, it says that all sin starts in the mind. So if we're going to work at, if God is going to uh, uh, um, work at our hearts and in our, in our brains to, to keep us from sinning, our minds have to be transformed before we can be able to say no to temptation or other bad things that will approach us in life, even if they are desirable things. And so we gave examples last time, Noah and Adam, Abraham, David, and Simon Peter are all examples of people who have messed up and messed up badly, yet they've changed their mind and they changed their outcome and their behavior based on those sins. They weren't indifferent about sexual immorality, just ask Uh, King David on how he perceives sexual morality one way before he commits it and one way completely different after he commits it and those are evident based on the psalms in which he writes and we can see a glimpse into the torment that happens when sin occurs now the second one is one of regret and remorse One that focuses on the consequences of my sins and not actually deals with the relationships of what those sins impact. Some examples in scriptures are Cain and Saul and Judas, like we've learned. One thing that we said last time that kind of stuck out is this, and I want to repeat it so that we can address it. A lot of times we ask ourselves, why we still struggle with sin, with temptation. And there's a difference between falling into sin and being addicted to your sins. And one thing that I said last week in this study is that if God has not freed you from your sin, we have not, or you have not, or I have not repented of it. And I want to say this in a very lovely, lovingly tone, because I'm sure you have, or at least I hope you have, dealt with people who have struggles and addictions and maybe sometimes you might think brother chris that comes off as unloving to tell somebody that they haven't repented of it and that's why they're still struggling with it and a lot of times they'll say no 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 don't you understand i put a an app on my phone i i I go to sleep at a certain time i don't drive down that certain lane i i don't buy that certain drink i don't do this i don't do that and they're looking at the behavior aspect and i'm not saying that's not a a good thing that is a good thing that they are putting in accountability into not sinning but if there is an addiction there if there is a power there if you are a slave to sin there it is that your mind it's not that you haven't said i'm sorry it's that your mind hasn't changed to the point that this sin is going to be so strange to you so 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 um uh abhorrent so you hate it so much that it, that it just completely separates you from relationship with God and that it's no longer an option. You see, Judas doesn't do that. So we're going to skip over what we talked about last time because I think we talked enough about Judas. One thing I have to say is the fact that last time we looked at the fact that he repented or apologized in a very nice manner. 
He said the right things. He confessed what he did. He even brought back the money to the chief priests, and it didn't buy him any salvation. It was more to ease the guilt and despair in his soul than it was to fix what he has done. So I'm going to talk about the real thing that I wanted to talk about last time, but we ran out of time, and it's going to be this. God grants us to repentance. When we look in the Bible, every single time that we see repentance, real repentance, that leads to salvation, it is a gift that comes from God and not we ourselves. You see, we're going to try to work our way into fixing ourselves, but if God does not grant us that repentance, it's not going to happen. Now, we sing a song at worship time that says, God is so good, and it's great. But the fact of the matter is, is that in scriptures, it completes that worship song that says that God is so good that it leads to our repentance. It leads to our metanoia, right? And so we talked a little bit about this last time, and I'm sure the worship leaders or those who are watching, watching that are uh, more um, focused on worship rather than other things in ministry, we caution of the fact that many times worship focuses on the emotions, on the regret, on, the, on the, the, the things that don't necessarily change our mind. They just change our feelings. And I would say that early 2000s, maybe late 90s, is when there was this huge shift from less necessarily teaching, less necessarily praying, and bringing in worship teams. Again, not a bad thing, not, not the wrong thing to do. But the emphasis for a long time, especially in the 2000s, was if you went to a church, the number one reason you went to the church was for the worship team. Now, you don't need to go far, and there's plenty of really great worship teams. They have tracks, they have instruments, everyone has talent, they understand the songs. But the thing is, and I keep asking myself if that is going to change here or be reformed in the next couple of years. If churches will look different, because churches in the 80s and 90s look different than in 2000 and 2010, right? Some of you that have been through the churches in the 80s and 90s would not recognize the churches of today. But what scares me is that this overemphasis on singing, not worship, because worship is more than singing, appeals more to our emotions rather than to our minds. And if we are going to repent, God needs to change our minds before he changes our emotions. So again, not a lot of people like this, and I'm trying to give support in this, that when we have these conversations, we understand what we need. And more than anything, what this church needs, what this country needs, what this world needs is godly sorrow that leads to repentance. We don't just need people to say, I'm sorry, and give restitution, and give money, and say, okay, everything's fine now. It won't be fine. So the text is Luke chapter 3, verse 8. And the first time I read this in scripture is John the Baptist. He's teaching, he's preaching, he's doing baptisms. And the Pharisees, they want to get baptized too. Interesting. Is it because they want to be part of the new hot and upcoming uh, trends? And so the the church leaders of the time... Uh, they try to be hip and they try to be cool and they try to get baptized. And John sees this. And I'm sure there were some that were uh, um, truly authentic and that listened to John and saw the fact that they need to repent. Again, these were the church leaders at the time. So they knew the Bible. They knew what they had to repent of. They knew what that word meant. But John cautions them, not only by calling them vipers, because some of them, We're only doing it for the eyes of of men. But in case somebody wasn't and those those, uh, Pharisees were actually being real, he says this, produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. So a lot of times we have to understand that it's not just the idea that, okay, our minds are changed and who changes our mind? God changes our mind when it comes to sin. Because we can always excuse ourselves. The book of Proverbs says that in our minds, we are all righteous. So we can excuse anything. We can excuse murder. We can excuse theft. We can excuse 
uh, blasphemy. We can excuse anything. Well, he had a good reason. Well, she had a good reason. Well, you haven't walked a mile in their shoes. Well, you don't understand they were really stressed out. Well, you don't understand he brings home all the money, and so he's allowed to, you know, so we can justify anything. But with God, it doesn't work like that. With God, it doesn't work like that. So what we're seeing here is John the Baptist saying, if you're truly repentant, if God really changed your mind, even if you're a Pharisee, you know, John the Baptist is doubting, but he allows grace. He says this, produce fruit, meaning allow that your mind that is changed to show in real life that you are repentant of those sins. So that you don't go to the same temptation. You don't fall into the same sin. You don't keep, you don't, you, you keep working, excuse me, towards being blameless. In the Bible, in Acts chapter 5, verse 31, it says this, God has exalted Christ to the right hand to be prince and savior. I highlighted there a word, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. If we think that we can repent on our own, we're only as good as Judas. And I'll tell you what, we won't apologize as good as him. We'll just say, I'm sorry. Two words, three words, and that's it. And think everything's okay. But that's not how it works with people or with God. I know with people because, like I said last week, many times I'll say I'm sorry, and my spouse will say, what for? Right? She'll be like, apologize like Judas. Tell me exactly the amount of silver that you brought back. Do this, do that. Don't worry, I do the same thing, right? But we don't, we don't apologize like that. We just say I'm sorry, and we say, okay, don't, you know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But that's not repentance, and that's what this culture thinks. So when we have these big billboards that say, repent, basically we're saying, say you're sorry for the things that you enjoy and go be miserable. No one's going to listen to that message. But if we tell them that God is the one that sees our sins, and God is the one that offers the gift to bring us to the knowing knowledge of Jesus Christ, what does it say here? Our Prince and our Savior who forgives our sins. And that relationship can be restored by the renewing of our mind, by understanding that faith comes, and that faith is helped by repentance, changing our minds. Not only that, it says further on that God also granted, meaning he gave, To the Gentiles, repentance of life. So God grants us true repentance. Have we ever stopped to consider the gift of God is not just the baby in the manger. The gift of God is not just the blessings and the food on the table. But a gift of God is that it allows us to change our minds when it comes to our sin and temptation, to our wrongdoing, to our desires to be transformed into his desires. That's a gift. There's a lot of people that we pray for on the list, including two of my brothers that are up there, and I can guarantee you this. No one's looking for them to say that they're sorry. Maybe the people who they've hurt in terms of relationship-wise, right, but that's not what we're praying for. Robert Farouk and all those people who we say that are in need of repentance, are in need of salvation of the Lord. We're not asking them to come into the church and say, hey, guys, we're sorry for X, Y, and Z. Some of us would think, okay, that's enough, but that's not enough. What we're praying for is that God offers them and grants them this gift that was offered to me and to you, which makes us no better than them. No better than the sinners out there. It's just that God offered this gift to us and we took it and we ran with it. We took it and our minds were renewed and we took it and we saw the fact that God has given us a gift that leads to forgiveness, forgiveness excuse me, of our sins. That makes us righteous when we were never supposed to be righteous. That gives us a forgiveness that we can't find here on earth, only in heaven. Last but not least, I have written there repentance is not a work to be done to earn salvation like many of us think, but it does result in the changing and the godly works of a person's life. You know, there's two people who betrayed Jesus, Judas and Simon Peter. Let's see what happens when Jesus meets with Simon Peter. 
You know, Simon Peter is not even recorded to say that he's sorry. His uh, only, I guess, conclusion is that after the rooster crowed three times, the Bible records that he left and whipped, wept, excuse me, bitterly. And again, you're saying, okay, well, Brother Chris, was that an emotion? Was that remorse? Or was he actually changing his mind? Did God grant him repentance so that he would never, ever again deny who Christ truly is? Well, let's see. The text comes from John chapter 21. And, John, and Peter, excuse me, doesn't say that he's sorry. What happens? What happens here is the same thing that happens what Paul is telling the church. That real repentance leads to restoration, to salvation, leads to faith. As soon as Simon Peter heard, this, uh, just a little bit of context, this is after Christ resurrects from the dead and the disciples are back, or the apostles, excuse me, are back in the Sea of Galilee uh, fishing and they don't know what's going on with Christ. They don't know what's, there's rumors, there's here and there of he has resurrected. They hear them say that it is the Lord And so Peter wraps around his outer garment and he jumps into the water. You know, to me, Peter's actions speak way more than we give him credit for. To be able to see the zeal, to be uh, how zealous and, and how much desire. Peter has for Christ, even though he betrayed him, even though he sinned against him, yet his desire is to go to him. His desire is to seek him out. Judas easily could have sought out Christ, for he wasn't dead when he gave back the money. If he really wanted to repent and have the gift of God that would offer him salvation, he would go to Christ, not to suicide, not to the things that he went to. And so we see here that Peter is acting differently. His mind is differently than the mind of Judas. We see here that repentance is working. And so as soon as he hears, he doesn't even have to confirm it. Right? It just says that's where Jesus is. He jumps out of the boat and swims all the way to shore. Now, Jesus and Peter have an interesting conversation there, one that is summarized by these verses. After three times, the third time says to Jesus, Excuse me, the third time Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now watch what the Bible says here. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Yeah, but, but Peter, is Jesus trying to rub it in? Is Jesus trying to hurt your feelings? Is Jesus trying to, to make a point? Is Jesus trying to, to have one up above you? The way that we, you know, when we deal with somebody who wronged us, we try to point it out. No, Jesus is not trying to do that, even though the Bible says that Peter was hurt when he's talking to Jesus. But the hurt there is this godly sorrow that led to and leads to Peter's restoration. And the same thing that Apostle Paul is saying happened to the church is the same thing that is happening to Peter, is the same thing that God asks of our own life. That we don't say, I'm sorry when we have sinned, but that we take upon it the, 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 the desire to ask God to give us this gift that only he can give that changes our mind, that changes the way that we look at sin, that changes the way we look at that which separates us from God so that we can be righteous. Now, we'll never be. The Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. Peter's not righteous, Judas isn't righteous, the church isn't righteous, and Corinth, and I'm not righteous. So then what, Brother Chris? The beauty about repenting and that comes to salvation is the fact that we don't have to rest on, on our own righteousness because God gives us his righteousness. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we ignore John the Baptist that says verses or that he preached to show us the works that keep in line with our repentance. But what I'm trying to say here is that Christ not only died, but he was tortured, he was mocked, he was beaten for our sins, great or small, hidden or the ones that are in the light. And so we have to be able to contemplate next time we're tempted, next time we are uh, approached with the opportunity to sin, that if it even is an option for us, that we need to be careful. Just like Pastor John said, that if there is guilt or sorrow that approaches us in our life, we need to address it, not ignore it. Because it's a warning of spiritual danger that Christ, and that as a creator and as wise as God is, God, God is put in our lives. So I have to ask you, brothers and sisters, is that if you're dealing with sorrow or grief in your life, it's not for nothing. If you're going through a difficult time, it's not for nothing. If, you, if you're wondering if God is going to use this, 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 this trial, this tribulation, uh, if, if God is going to use this towards, towards our good, then the answer is if it leads towards our repentance, then it is. And if it doesn't, then it's just an emotional Exercise And brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I've had enough emotional exercise. Let's either do it or not do it. Let's either repent or not repent. Let's either be sons and daughters of light or not be. Let's either be hot or cold, not in the middle. So brother Chris, what are you saying? Well, the beauty of being able to gather the same way that the disciples gather, the same way that churches and bodies of believers all around the globe gather, is that they do certain things. And it gives us a good example of what we need to do as well. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the Bible says. And for the last half hour, 35 minutes, that's what we were doing. We were dissecting the letter of the, the um, verse in which Paul wrote to the church and fellowship. We've done that, and we will do that. As soon as we got here, we shook hands. We, we, we talked about God's goodness. We, we've smiled at each other to the breaking of the bread. That's when we have the Lord's Supper, but two prayers. I think the most important thing is that repentance comes through prayer. A lot of our times... Our minds are changed on topics. Once we argue or wrestle, whatever you want to call it, you can call it prayer. But many times my prayer, it doesn't look like head bowed, knees bowed, hands together in perfect prayer posture. Many times I'm mowing the lawn and, and arguing with the Lord. And he says and answers and brings a renewal of the mind no matter what your prayer or my prayer looks like. But the important thing is that you pray. And so here at this church, one of the things that we, that we boast in, even though we shouldn't boast in anything except in the Lord, but one of the things that we boast in is the fact that we call and we ask the congregation, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the benches this morning, that you be part of the service. And by that we say this, that if the apostles taught together and fellowship together and broke bread together and prayed together, then it shouldn't be strange for us to get together and pray. To look through our lives, what brings us sorrow, what brings us pain, what things we fall into sin. And ask God that he would give us the divine gift of repentance so that we don't fall in those temptations, that we don't fall into those sins, that we do live out our repentance with the works that are preceded by faith. If that were to happen, I'll tell you that your spouse will find you different. I'll tell you that your parents will find you different. I tell you that your children will find you different. I tell you that your church will find you different, and so will your colleagues, because repentance is a gift that cannot be shut up. And it is one that is often shared. And who knows better than Paul about how God changed his mind on the road to Damascus. And so he was bold enough to write a letter to a church that, yeah, Maybe they're going to ignore him and say, you know what, this Paul guy, I know he planted our church, but we don't need him anymore. 
And at that risk, Paul wrote the truth anyways out of love, and God blessed it by bringing a godly sorrow to those people. And I'm asking that in this prayer, we ask God to bring us not a sorrow that leads to death or regret, but that one that brings to salvation. Amen? Let's stand, please. I know that there are going to be different people who preach on this topic. I know Brother Lemmy has his way of, 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 of bringing the message, Brother Aurel, myself, Greg. And so whichever way the message reaches your heart, I would ask that you do not ignore it. Whichever way it gets to metanoia, changing of your mind when it comes to our sinful nature and, and, and sinning against an almighty and all holy God, I ask that in this prayer, my dear brothers and sisters, we ask God for one gift. Not a bigger house, not a bigger car, not a bigger job, not a bigger school, just for one gift. Not even for better health. That we ask him for the gift of repentance that only he can give. And then, after that, we can praise his name and glorify his name and worship his name and sing his name because God has changed our mind and he has brought repentance to our hearts and then we can truly worship of God that we could begin to comprehend. So let's come together, let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray as one to the throne of God. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for... This morning, I thank you so much, Lord. That